Welcome back again, ladies and gentlemen, to another session of Open Mic. Tonight, today, I have a very special candidate running for the at-large position with the PEP. He's no stranger to politics, ladies and gentlemen, and he's not afraid to speak his mind. I really appreciate him coming in tonight. I want you guys to sit back, listen, listen attentively. You have a lot of choices to make, ladies and gentlemen, a lot. But I believe this young man, I'm not endorsing anyone, I'm simply stating my mind. I believe this young man has a lot to offer, so please give him your attention. I want to welcome uh, Natalia Wheatley, better known as Shawande. I like Shawande because Natalia sometimes is hard to remember. But welcome, Shawande, welcome to the studio. You on the open mic, so please, please, share yourself with the viewers. Well, Tell us a little bit about who you are as a person. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, thank you for having me here on the program. And you don't have to be afraid to endorse me, you know. <laughs> I'm the right man for the job, as you already said. My name is Natalia Wheatley. I also go by the name Shawande Uhuru. I'm no stranger to politics. Uh, for the past about 10 years or so, I've been back in the Virgin Islands, coming back from school. And I've been active in politics. I've been acting active in engaging the public on various issues. I'm a regular co-host on Umoja, a program on ZBVI. That's heard every uh, Thursday evening. I've marched against things. I've, I've rallied against things. And I'm here before you seeking your vote at large with People's Empowerment Party. And we definitely have plans. We have the proposals. We have the right character to get the job done. All right, all right. Shawande, the, the, it's crowded. Yes. It's very crowded. 42 candidates. Mm -hmm. um, you're running with the PEP. At one point, you were running with the PPA. Um, why you made the switch? Tell the folks why you think the fit that you're with now is the best fit to move forward. Well, the PPA was a really good thing. Um, as you said, I, was r I ran with the PPA four years ago with Shana Smith, Elton Carlwood, and Coy Smith. And we made a valiant effort. We were young people, really wanting to see the, the territory move forward. Um, I saw the need for us, uh, having some mentorship, you know, because young people are good. We have a lot of ideas, but we need um, some, a guiding hand. At least that's how I felt about it. And um, everybody may not see things the same way. So that's really where the split with me came. You know, and I went to the People's Empowerment Party um, seeking that type of mentorship, um, partnering with somebody like Honorable Alvin Christopher, who champions good governance, and he has been championing good governance throughout his 20-year term. I saw it as an excellent opportunity to work with him and other really experienced people. And he's not afraid to, to pass on the torch as he passed on the torch to to Elford Parsons. So um, the older people can't stay in politics forever, um, but we just can't kick them out <laughs> in the way that we want to. We need proper succession planning. Uh, so young people need uh, mentorship. I chose a mentorship of, of someone like Alvin Christopher and some of the other more experienced people. I, I, I don't really agree with the mentorship of, uh, let's say, the, the ruling party, National Democratic Party, because I don't really agree with a lot of the things they've done. Great, great. Well. Um, moving forward with who you're with, you're done with them, um, and it is a good team. Give me, give me some sort of plan. If I were to consider voting for you or anyone out there watching this program, give me some sort of plan. You, you're running as an at-large, mm -hmm. um, territorial at-large person. Um, talk to the people in Anagata, talk to the people in Justin Dyke, talk to the people in Tortola, because you're going to be represent that wide scope of people. Give us your plan. Well, the Premier announced that they gave about $1.2 million to small businesses. We in the People's Empowerment Party thinks that needs to increase a lot by at least 400%. And we have to fa uh, place the focus on small business. Small business is the engine of growth of any economy. The, n the National Democratic Party has a focus on big business. As I have said in the past, and I'll continue to say, they are the Republican Party of the Virgin Islands. Um, they believe by giving 
concessions to the ultra-rich that something will trickle down to the rest of us. And most people in the world, you know, thus far, we, we know that that's false. That's not the truth. We have to put um, the, our strength and our money and our policies and commitment behind regular, ordinary people and help them to grow. And there's some good examples of how we can do that. Uh, you, s you spoke about speaking to people at Annie Gad and Jas Van Dyke. Um, fishing is very popular in the Virgin Islands. We're surrounded by water. We need to help our fisher persons to be able to get some big trawlers, to be able to go out in the ocean and f fish for weeks and weeks and weeks. We've heard um, so, so many times that we have people like the Japanese coming up there at the North Drop up there in Anigata and fishing our waters and probably even selling the same fish back to us. And, you know, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, um, that's one of our distinct advantages here in the Virgin Islands, fishing. And we can really do a lot to take fishing to the next level, to the point where we can be canning fish and even exporting it. And certainly... Um, supplying our own territory with fish, which would help us cut back on the food import bill. Another area of focus could be poultry farming. Uh, poultry, and fa poultry farming is a legitimate business. We import millions and millions of dollars of chicken every single year. And those millions of dollars can be uh, circulating within our own economy. We have a lot of young men who are sitting on the side of the roads and uh, who need employment. All of them can't be employed by government. All of, all of them don't want to be employed by government. They want to be entrepreneurs. They want a certain level of independence. Some of them are already raising chickens already, you know, be, be, because they're interested in, in fowl fighting and things like that. We want to shift the attention from fowl fighting and shift it to being a poultry farmer, being your own entrepreneur. That's going to provide construction work for a lot of our uh, contractors, and we're not going to just be enriching just a small few contractors while everybody else staffs. We believe in spreading the wealth um, as long as people are qualified and they will do a good job for the people we're getting value for money. So constructing those chicken pens all throughout the territory will provide a lot of work for the contractors. It's going to provide business opportunities for a lot of young men on the streets and we will be able to transport those chickens to the slaughterhouse, get them slaughtered, transport them to the market, uh, when, where the public can have access to good quality chicken without all the hormones and the health hazards that come with the imported chicken. We also have ideas for agricultural depot, basically a one-stop shop for everything local. You could get all your locally made tarts, your locally made um, pea soup, everything you could think about, locally grown produce, uh, agricultural produce, um, even fishing. Perhaps you could um, combine the, f um, the fish Fish, um, fishing complex with an agricultural depot. And I think it will be something that can do well. It could help to supply different uh, markets around the territory. So definitely being <coughs> self-sufficient is, is a main focus. Um, taking, taking, because you said something that's very I important. Mm -hmm. The import cost is very high. Yes. Um, the cost of food importing is very high. Yes. How would you tackle how would you tackle this high cost of living, specifically when it comes to food importation? Well, this is something that the People's Empowerment Party is very qualified to deal with. And let me just say first of all that the National Democratic Party is telling you that they're going to deal with the cost of living uh, next term, when they had a, this term to deal with it. Uh, if people would remember the last time they were in power, at the end of their term, they put together a cost of living committee I believe John Klein was, was the head of that committee. And we haven't seen anything in regards to the cost of living. In fact, um, the only thing we saw from them this time is when they gave a big concession to businesses in terms of the uh, insurance on freight, uh, you know, the duty on, on freight and insurance. And um, those savings were not passed on to the consumers. So one thing we in the People's Empowerment Party will ensure is that we give any concessions to businesses on any particular item in terms of um, easing up on duty and things like that. We'll ensure that the savings are passed on to the consumer through some type of price ceiling for, 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 for specific goods. We realize as well we have to deal with the cost of shipping. Uh, shipping is very expensive. Uh, one idea we're proposing is that people come together and ship together and we in the government will help to facilitate that. Because when you ship in bulk, 
it's a lot cheaper for you. We also have to work with our local shipping agencies and see how we can strengthen them to be able to go to places like the United States of America and come back with the goods at a cheaper price than we're getting it from some of the other providers. So we need to make sure that the market forces are working well within the shipping company. We have a sh appropriate competition um, because when you don't have competition and a, a, a shipping agent and a wholesaler is holding you hostage, they can basically charge whatever price they want to. So we have to make sure that we have good competition in shipping and we have to have good competition in wholesaling. So would you, would you, would you then, uh, uh, would the PEP then support a consumer protection agency with some sort of real enforcement? Fantastic. And everybody is speaking about that, uh, Consumer Protection Agency. We too endorse it, but the others have had the opportunity to do it for a long time and they haven't done it. If you put us in power, the People's Empowerment Party, we will certainly put a consumer protection agency in place that can check on some of the, you know, make sure that people are not being sold expired goods and things like that. But also, we could have a consumer pricing index to publish prices, and that will encourage people to lower their prices with, 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 with more competition. And there's some other things that we can really um, think about in terms of a consumer protection agency. That's absolutely a must. I wanted to address something else uh, when you spoke about the cost of living. It's absolutely essential that we raise the minimum wage. But this is another point uh, we have to deal with, Sam. When you raise the minimum wage, um, there's a possibility that you could increase the cost of living if the business owners put up the price of their goods corresponding um, with raising the minimum wage. So we believe that we have to explore some measure of price control, not on all goods, but some essential goods that people need to survive. Yeah, well, well, I think anyone who's able to just really do their own research will find that the consumer price index yeah. rose probably 10, 15 percent in the past three and a half years. Absolutely. I mean, given the fact that the government gave a lot of the larger importers such a huge tax break and we're assuming that that break would have passed on to the consumer uh, it, it seemed like it was a bit of a challenge. Well um, you see um, the National Democratic Party is a, a government of businessmen and some people believe that only businessmen can run the Virgin Islands. It's not true. Businessmen are going to look out for the interests of businessmen. They're not really going to look out for the, the interests of employees and consumers because when they raise the minimum wage they're sending up their payroll. They're increasing their payroll. And they will be very reluctant to do that. And I wish that they had the courage to be able to raise the minimum wage before elections. But certain things they're not going to do before elections. They're just going to do a cruise pair that, you know, both parties supported. You know, PEP, VIP, NDP, we supported extending the pair. That's a bipartisan um, project. The landside development is another case. But they're going to um, call elections right after they've um, fired some fireworks to blind uh, the people. <laughs> well, fireworks it is. Uh. <laughs> they're going to see some fireworks from me before it's all said and done. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little about, uh, let's, let's, let's focus a little bit on finance of the country. Yes. Um, do you think the country's financially sound right now? Uh, uh, are we better off than we were before? And, and moving forward, if we're not, in your um, perspective, what measures do you think need to be put in place? Well, we need better people to manage the finances. It's, it's, we have a lot of rules in place already, and the rules are really being abused. And I anticipate that the next uh, term that we have here, the United Kingdom, will be a lot more um, forceful with the Virgin Islands because of the mismanagement of the National Democratic Party. They have sold to the public that they are the best managers of the finance, but let's take a look at a few things they've done thus far. Uh, they have, if not doubled, they must have tripled our debt. And the only thing that they're saying is that they're a big man government and a big man government can borrow, but it's really our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren who are going to have to pay back that debt. debt. I mean, when they came in here, the debt, the debt was uh, maybe around $100 million or something like that. Or, or, or maybe even less. And most of that debt was for the, for the hospital project that they, um, they started. But since they've come in there, they've borrowed over 120 million. Uh, I, I've heard even figures of 150 million. And they're absolutely proud of that. But you know, uh, next time, they won't, we, won't, we won't be able to borrow a dime because we've made the borrowing guidelines 
into a joke. And a lot of that money that uh, has been borrowed is to try to impress the public to get a, another term in office. Let's take the $16 million loan from Social Security, for instance. We know that's a form of bribery. Right before election, you're making sure everybody's machine is working, everybody has money in their pockets. When you starved everybody for the first three years and spoke about the fact that you don't want to spend money, you want to put all the money away in the treasury. Now, I understand the need to save, but you can't save everything and leave it your people to starve. That's not a compassionate government. You have to be able to spend and save as we go along. But you can't try to um, save $15 million every year and your people are suffering. Uh, so, so, so many people are calling it a campaign gimmick. Is that what you're calling it? It's absolutely a campaign gimmick. And anybody who, who really pays attention and who's not fooled by all of the trickery will know that that's a form of bribery. We even have um, <laughs> people going around right now, uh, members of the um, candidates for the ruling party, giving out contracts. You know, um, that's, that's what the voters have been telling us. You go to places like Just Van Dyke, and you have people going around there actually giving out contracts, trying to bribe voters. Yeah. You know, and you know, it's something that should not be tolerated. And you know, I'm critical of the governor uh, because of these type of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. wait, let me ask you that. Speaking mm -hmm. about that, the governor, uh, I think I read somewhere where you um, were a bit uh, unhappy with some of the decision the governor has made. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I was asked a question. Uh, because I made some comments at a, a speech in Anigata, a rally that we had in Anigata, speaking about some of the practices I believe that we have to let the sun set on. And one of the practices is, is you know, legislators uh, circumventing the rules. We have a rule that legislators have to declare any type of arrangements they have in terms of providing services to the government. And we have uh, Honorable Myron Walwin, who has been providing... Um, food to the House of Assembly to the tune of $100,000 or more. And uh, he has not declared that, and uh, clearly that's against the rules. Now, he said that he provides the services on an ad hoc basis, but if ad hoc gets you $100,000, I don't want to see what a contractual arrangement would have gotten you. So it's obvious that you have an ongoing relationship supplying food with the House of Assembly but you have not put anything on a dotted line. So there's a verbal agreement in place and not necessarily a written agreement. Uh, certainly there's an expectation for him to pr um, uh, provide uh, food services to the House of Assembly, and we have to say it's wrong. I mean, you have several other people in the House of Assembly who have had to come to the House of Assembly and ask permission to be able to engage in those type of arrangements with either government or even statutory bodies. Now, in the case of, of Honorable Walwin, he doesn't have to do that. He's above the conventions and he's above the rules of the House of Assembly. And I'm saying to the people of the Virgin Islands, you might agree with some of the things that he's done. He has very good public relations. He has a lot of good energy and activity. But you can't start calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. Yeah. Because then we will get into a lot of problems here in the Virgin Islands if we don't hold a particular standard. So if you were given an opportunity then um, in, in government and you were able to bring forth some new ideas, would you support new legislation, a new uh, general order, standing order, um, specifically addressing those type of concerns? Or would you leave it open, hoping that at some point you might be privy to that same uh, opportunity? Well, I think, well, I, I personally, I don't um, see um, the need to get into those type of arrangements at all. Me personally, I believe let somebody else have the business. That $100,000 that um, you're providing to the House of Assembly, Honorable Walwin, let another food provider um, get that. You, you're doing well enough already. We have to be able to spread the wealth. Some of that work that he's doing for the um, BVI um, health services, let somebody else get that work. We have a lot of lawyers out there who could really do with some of that work, and I don't think he needs to have all. I think as a community, we need to have a real uh, conversation about conflict of interest. A lot of people say that the place is too small. I don't think it's too small. I, I, for every service that you know, one of these legislators is providing to government or the House of Assembly, I see several other people out there who can provide the same service. And I just think it's a question of, of they're not willing to make any sacrifices. 
And we have to be willing to make some sacrifices when we become legislators and we want to serve the people. It can't just be all about enriching ourselves. Yes, we deserve to have um, a, a, a good home and to be able to provide a living for ourselves. But, you know, make a sacrifice to serve the people. Yeah, okay. Um, while we're on uh, Honorable Walwyn, uh, he's the Minister for Education. Um, most of the people that I spoke with on the street are, are comfortable. Um, not all, but most of them are comfortable. They think that education has moved to a different level. Um, the bar has been risen. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also some, some comments about maybe some uh, things need to be changed, edited, audited, moved around, moved left, moved right. You're an educator. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with the, the education process in the past three and a half years? Or if you were given an opportunity to make some change, would you make those changes and what those changes would look like? Well, in the education system, I'll give uh, Honorable Wilder credit for the technical school. Of course, we had a technical school before. So, I mean, we, we have to um, be careful what we attribute to Honorable Wildwin. We had technical school before. He has improved it, you know, and I agree with what exactly what he's done with the technical school, and he has a good team around him who's been doing a lot of good work for him. But uh, the education system, and let me just be very clear about this, as an educator, as someone who interacts on a regular basis with students, we have excellent students coming out of the education system, but we have a lot of students who are slipping through the cracks. And we have great deficiencies in the education system. Great deficiencies in the education system. And it only goes to show you that um, the fact that we have so many people who are running to the private institutions, a lot of people who are not comfortable sending their children to public school, uh, it only goes to show you that there are some great deficiencies in the system. Now, Honorable Waldron has good public relations. You know, he has excellent public relations. He, he needs to thank um, his public relations person. And he's done some good things that, in my opinion, are just around the periphery of the problem, not really addressing the concrete issues that an educator such as myself would want to address. Such as? Give us two examples. Reading. Okay. Honorable Walwyn has not tackled reading at all. And you have um, Lyndon Smith, who um, she's doing some wonderful yeah, work. She's a pioneer. With the Reading Council. Honorable Walwyn should have partnered with Lyndon Smith from the very beginning. And all of that money that he has in the budget, he's had the biggest piece of the pie of the budget for years. Some, a lot of that should have gone towards strengthening the fundamental skills such as reading. We need to do something about early childhood education. We have some um, daycare centers that are doing a wonderful job, actually. They're some doing some very good job. We may need to make sure that there's consistency across the board. Um, we have a lot of young people who they don't have the support at home. They have parents out walking and things like that. So we need to ensure that every young person has the after-school programs to help them if they're struggling in a particular area. We need to make sure that we have interve an intervention program for people who are not um, seeing properly, not hearing properly, they have learning disabilities. We can't wait until they get very late in, um, in their student life to be able to try to address these problems. You have to address them very early on. Another problem in the education system is discipline. We've seen so many problems with discipline um, over these past three years and, and beyond, and Aaron, Honorable Walden has not dealt with those problems sufficiently. He took some of the students who are, quote unquote, being dumped in the technical um, program over there in Bargas Bay and put them in a the night school. And they started to disrupt the situation in the night school. So we're proposing having a special program for them so they don't disrupt the night school, they don't disrupt the technical school, and before allowing them to get to the point where there's such a, a big problem. From very early on, I'm talking from the point when they're seven, eight, nine years old, you have a program in place that can stop that problem from developing yeah. and not trying to stop it when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. Also in the education system, the infrastructure needs, um, needs to be improved. Let's take Elmer Stout, for instance. You have so many little old buildings. We need to knock down some of those old buildings and have a more efficient use of space. Uh, when I was um, graduating high school, we just 
built that little L-shaped um, building here, what they, call, what they call the new school over there when I was going to school at Elmo Stout. Um, there was another half of that building that was supposed to be constructed. What happened to that? Uh, I, I mean, it's um, about 20, <laughs> 20 years since the construction of that building, and we still haven't put up that other building. We can put a gymnasium, you know, on those grounds. You know, we could put a lot of other facilities, a proper, a proper um, volleyball court. We could even have a swimming pool there. I mean, we can do so many different things um, if we make a more efficient use of the space there. Uh, also, uh, we, we can think about having a junior high school. You know, to lessen the burden on road town. Have yeah. junior high schools in East End, junior high schools in West End, maybe some, some place else in the central part of, of road town, you know, um, yeah. Virgin Gorda. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do in the education system. A lot of deficiencies are there that need to be addressed. All right, real quick, just touch on this in, in a very short way. Um, obviously, uh, Minister Wallerin added a new year, another year mm -hmm. to the whole school um, system. Do you support that? No, I don't support the, the new year in the secondary school. There's been some conversations about having the year placed, you know, maybe in a primary school or a junior high school or so, so on and so forth. But I believe before we have any discussions about an extra year, we need to fix what's there already. Because it's like the example I gave when they first gave the, um, the whole proposal of having an extra year. You have some real deficiencies in the education system. You have to address those deficiencies, and those deficiencies are, you know, have to do with quality as opposed to quantity. If you have a child that's not eating their vegetables, they're having three meals a day, they're not eating their vegetables, it, their situation is not going to improve by adding a fourth, <laughs> a fourth meal. You know, what you have to do is see why they're not eating their vegetables and try to get them to eat their vegetables. So it's not simply a question of, of, of quantity. It's a question of quality. And I believe if we address some of the issues that we have in terms of the quality of the education, the amount of years we have currently is enough. It was enough for myself. It was enough for a lot of people who were in the school system before us. What we have to do is fill some of the gaps, some of the people who are struggling. Discover, well, why is it that they're struggling? Are, are they struggling because they don't have an extra year? Some of the people who are struggling are already 18, 19 years old by the time they come to the end of their school year. In fact, some of the younger students are the ones who perform the best, the ones who, ne who never repeated a grade. Mm -hmm. you know? And all young students are not immature. You know, it has to do with how they're being raised. It has to do with the classroom environment, whether we have people in there who can control the classroom or not. And it has to do with um, some of the social programs we need to put in place in the community to ensure good character. Definitely. Well, Sharonda, we're winding down. We got about seven or eight more minutes. Oh, wow. Well, that's actually, going quickly. <laughs> I know. When you're putting it all, the plans <laughs> out there, man. And I'm sure the people are very happy to hear what you're saying. Um, let me ask you off the bat. Uh, a few things that came up in the past three and a half uh, years. You know, sometimes when you're uh, in, your, in your situation, you'll be an at-large person. Uh, assume you get in. Um, you're in there with yourself or maybe the PEP P, 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 um, group. Um, would you support um, protection of uh, land? You know, we had uh, issues where land sort of being taken away from uh, citizens for development would you would you protect that well I, I think if you take that step you definitely have to make sure that you explore all possibilities and only in a, a real real emergency you ever consider um, compulsory acquisition um, in terms of the, the um, situation there at Long Swamp I don't think that the government uh, did all they could do to negotiate with the family and I certainly don't think that a government should um, uh, you know, have that kind of heavy hand. But this is a big man government, you know. <laughs> they, are, they talk about the fact that they are big man government. They don't like consultation. They like just to make decisions regardless of how it impacts people. I certainly think that people, they have the hard on land, family land. You give them every opportunity to hold on to that land. But not just that. We need a land bank. And people have been talking about land bank for well, a long time. Well, speaking about land bank, Honorable uh, um, uh, uh, Walwyn, I remember specifically part of his uh, campaign talk the last time, the first time around, was that uh, the government would come up with some sort of a land bank situation. 
We haven't seen or heard anything of that since. Well, I mean, they, they're going to do everything for you during campaign time. I remember during the last election, they were complaining about the fact that Honorable Fraser said they would give you a uh, 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 free electrics bill in December. And um, Honorable Christian, I believe it was, said, if it was, if it would, if it was us, we'd give it to you in July. And then when the National Democratic Party got in, I, I believe the only thing that they, they gave you for free was the surcharge, and I think they just did that once or twice. I'm not even sure if they did it twice. So the campaign rhetoric and actually governance are two completely different things. You have to look at the record when they're there. Um, they have a lot of good public relations, but check some of the, the promises that they, um, they, yeah. um, they promoted during the last time and see how many of them they've actually um, completed. Yeah. And I would say that they don't have a good record when it comes to that. Definitely. Things it's like a, a land bank and things like that. Yeah, we haven't seen it. Um, and we know for a fact that um, uh, a lot of uh, costs has escalated in, in every category. Some I believe are good, my own personal view, but some I think could have uh, maybe taken a different approach. Can, can, can uh, I adjust that really quickly? Sure. Um, in terms of the health services, I, I think that it was a bit callous to raise all the prices all at the same time before you have um, any proper means for people to pay for it is a bit callous. Some of the prices are, are extremely high. I mean, sometimes you think of whether Richard Branson and Jarecki have more expensive rooms than you have right there in Peebles Hospital. I mean, it's insane. Um, and we got to make sure that the, 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 the health care is quality. And you can't have quality health care without proper diagnosis. And I think it's a shame that after building a, a hospital for over $100 million, I mean, that's an astronomical figure, that you don't even have proper equipment in the health, uh, in the health services. You still have to go to Eureka, sometimes pay $900, $1,000 uh, to get that diagnosis. And I think that's a real shame. And I think there's been a lot of mismanagement. I'm not saying that everything is bad. But there's been a lot of mismanaging, and health care is way too expensive. We have to focus on preventative care, first of all, because if people are getting sick all the time, it's going to run anybody, you know, it's going to run the treasury dry in any country if you keep getting sick. Yeah. So we have to um, focus more on education, focus more on how we eat and uh, how we exercise and uh, certain practices that we have to do to stay healthy. Yeah, well, that's definitely something you'll be pushing, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, crime. We had a jump in crime, big yes. spike in crime in the past uh, uh, years or so. Not just the three and a half years, but, you know, over, the, over a number of years. Yeah. Um, what's contributing to so much crime in the BVI? What would you do differently to maybe uh, minimize some of that? Well, the NDP has been negligent on the issue of crime and, and, and social development. They've been absolutely negligent. Recently, they passed the... Um, the, the gun law that would make minimum mandatory sentences, I believe, maybe 10, 10 years or so. Um, that's something that they promised to do. They, they, they deliver very late on that, but that's fine. But you have to do much more than that. You have to prevent um, uh, young people developing to the point where they even look to pick up arms. And what we want to do in the People's Empowerment Party is to make sure at a very young age, young people have access to programs that will provide them with mentorship to improve their character, to expose them to certain activities that will help them discover their hidden talents. Uh, the Youth Empowerment Project, uh, that was the brainchild of Noni Georges and myself. Uh, one summer I came home and I noticed all the problems taking place in the community. There's nothing really for the young people to do. Uh, we took the idea to Kedrick, Honorable Kedrick Pickren. Uh, Jarecki got involved and the rest is history. You have the Youth Empowerment Project. But it was never our intention just to have one youth empowerment project right there in Fat Hogs Bay. We wanted to have those throughout the territory, and we can um, explore public-private partnerships in terms of how we make that happen. But you have to give um, young people programs to be able to direct their energies in a positive way. Teach them to swim. Teach them how to sail. You know, teach them how to draw. Teach them how to, to use electronic um, technology. 
Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with young people, and if you put the investment and time in them, I believe we can prevent a lot of them from going in the negative direction that they're going. And if we're afraid to invest in them when they're young, when they get older, we're going to have to be investing a lot of money in, in them when they go up to Balsam Gut. Okay. <laughs> and Balsam Gut is busting at the seams right now, yeah. and the NDP government, for the most part, is negligent. Yeah. Um, last question, and then I'll give you a chance to do your closing. Um, tourism, of course, is the lifeline of uh, many, many people, yes. directly and indirectly. Um, I'm in tourism, you know that. Yes. Um, many of us, you know, we can't wait to see our cruise ship come in. Uh, we can't wait to, uh, we hope to see uh, the, the road town full of people yes. walking around, hope they need transportation. We love to see them eat and socialize. Yes. We want to see people at all our different beaches. Um, what would the PEP bring to the table? in addition to what we already have that is not uh, already on the table? Okay, well, our view of the economy generally and our view of tourism is that you have to build tourism and the economy through your people. I think that's a real difference in terms of how the National Democratic Party Break looks at it. Down. Break that down. Well, the National Democratic Party just wants to um, build tourism through bringing in a bunch of uh, developers in tourism. But we want to take the people who are already invested in tourism and build through them. So some of that loan funding that we're speaking about is going to help our people within the related areas of tourism take their business to the next level. Which means when you come off the, 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 the cruise ship and you get something to eat, we want each and every person coming off that cruise ship at least to know what pea soup is and to say that I have to try this pea soup that you have here. Because you got to make sure that you have a unique experience, an experience that's unique to the Virgin Islands, not an experience that you could get in Jamaica, experience you could get any place else in the world. And where else can you get um, pea soup with milk and sugar? You have to make sure that when they listen to music, they listen to the Lashing Dogs, they listen to, to, to um, Shainai, and they're listening to Maccabee, and they're listening to the Razor Blades, make sure each and every one of them walk back with a CD. You have to make sure that if they buy a swimsuit, that they're going to buy a swimsuit from Kristen Fraser, who on her own mostly was able to do such tremendous work that even the great Beyonce, a multi-million dollar recording artist, is wearing her bathing suits. And, and, her, and Chris, her child. And Chrisette Michelle. And her child, uh, I think um, Blue is the child's name. So that's what we're talking about, build your tourism product through your people. Let's take VI Air Link. You know, the, the, the government did do... Um, an arrangement with them, and I do applaud them for that, but we need to take it to the next level. You have a place like the Dominican Republic. You know this, Sam, because you're into tourism. Dominican Republic has flights from as far as Europe. They have flights from United States of America. They have flights throughout Latin America. Um, we sh should open up a new route here from the Virgin Islands to the Dominican Republic. We have a high population of people who live here anyway, and people who would certainly like to visit the Dominican Republic here. It's a route that makes economic sense. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about building the tourism product through our people. Of course, we have to make sure we protect our environment. And we're not fooled by the National Democratic Party's new love of the environment. Because when I first came home here, Sam, there was a project going on called the Beef Island Project. And if for that Beef Island Project, the National Democratic Party wanted to dig up a 10-acre salt pond. And you know the importance of salt ponds in terms of protecting the pristine beaches that we have here. It, it, it filtrates all the silt coming down off of the uh, mountains mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. They wanted to b dig up that salt pond to put a mega yacht marina. I mean, you know, destroy our environment for the benefit of the rich. I was completely against it. That's why I got involved in that Beef Island project. They wanted to destroy one of the most pristine areas, not just in the Virgin Islands, but in the world in the Hands Creek. And if not for people like myself and the Environmental Council, who took them to court, um, they would have destroyed that area there at Beef Island. But we need to protect the environment, and the environment is something that we can market very well. We need to ensure that we have proper access to the Virgin Islands. We need to fix up the ferry terminal that we have there in the West End, uh, fix up the terminal that we have there in Road Town. We need to make sure that we have ferry services that can meet whatever planes landing in places like St. Thomas and get them here so they don't have to spend the night in St. Thomas. I mean, these are things all that they're promising to you next time, but what did they do about it this time? 
and the situation was very bad this time around. Um, ferry services were very poor. I mean, um, the, ferry, um, the ferry operators, they have been crying for a long time about some of the problems that they have. And I believe that the government should have been a leader and proactive in providing a good solution to all parties involved. Good, good. Uh, wonderful. Well, uh, let me put one on the table that's uh, uh, um, it's there, it's burning. I put it to other folks who've been on this show. Um, you spoke about the ferry service. Let's talk a little bit about the airport. Yes. Uh, Mr., uh, you know, uh, the Honorary Kedrick Picking was labeled as Mr. Dundeal. Yes. Um, I think many folks um, uh, may have been against the, the concept of expanding and developing the airport. Um, in a nutshell, would you support an expanded airport facilitating people coming directly to the BVI? And, and you being, what is the position of PEP, the entire uh, the body? Um, because that is, that is one of our main security issues. Mm -hmm. It is one of the main vehicles to getting people here yeah. where we don't have to depend so much on St. Thomas. Um, and, and, and in a lack of ferry service, adequate ferry service between us and St. Thomas, um, the airport somehow would be the best link for some. What is your take on that? Well, Sam, if we could land a spaceship <laughs> here in the Virgin Islands, I'd be so support of it. I think anybody, if you could fly directly from here to another place, they would support it. But for me, the problem with it is does it make economic sense? Now, when you're um, throwing around figures like $377 million, you know that's way too expensive for us here. And the last thing that they asked um, the Honorable Minister Kedrick Pickering to do, I think should have been the first thing he thought about, which was show us the numbers, show us that this, um, prove to us, don't just tell us, prove to us that this airport will be able to make money with an expanded airport. I would like to see that. I would like to see something in writing that says to me that these airlines will be willing to come here to the Virgin Islands. We have to come to grips with our size. We have to come to grips with the size of our population, the fact that we are ma not a mass tourism destination. If it can happen at a price that we can afford, certainly um, we should certainly consider it. But the situation we have in Beef Island is a difficult one. I think anybody who, you know, who have been exposed to some of the meetings and some of the information says it's very difficult because of, you know, the positioning of the Terence B. Letsom Airport at this particular moment. But in the meantime, while we try to get the information that we need to get, we need to at least ensure that we have good feeder service, that we're able to feed into an Antigua, um, St. Thomas to the ferry, St. Martin, Saint well. Martin Puerto, Rico. Puerto Rico, and I've already suggested that we try to increase, you know, the amount of, of feeder ports that we have. A place like the Dominican Republic makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it, it, we might even consider um, flying to Jamaica. Yeah. who knows? Definitely. Well, Sharonda, I think uh, you and I, <laughs> you and I could uh, keep this going all night. Yeah. Um, you, you you laid out your plan, your ideas, your vision. Um, you know, look into the camera and tell uh, the folks out there uh, why why they should vote for you, why they should give the PEP uh, members them a vote. Uh, again, it's crowded, but uh, give us your best pitch. Well, uh, people of the Virgin Islands, on June 8th, I humbly ask, I'm a humble person, I humbly ask for you to cast uh, a vote on your ballot for Natalio Shawande Uhuru Wheatley. Uh, member of, of the People's Empowerment Party. I guarantee you that I'll be a humble servant, and I, I don't just talk the servant talk around election time and then forget all about the fact that I'm serving you and become the big bad boss. No, I'll be humble and I'll serve you, and the rest of the members of the People's Empowerment Party will serve you as well. We have plans, we have policies, we have the right character to get the job done. So on June 8th, bring us home. I'm talking about in the 2nd District, Mr. Elford Parsons in the 9th District, Ferris, and at large we have Larry Reimer, Alvin Christopher, and yours truly, Natalia Wheatley, also known as Shawande Uhuru. We humbly ask for your vote. And uh, thank you for listening uh, to me tonight. And also thank you, um, Sam, 
for having me. It was a real pleasure to be here. I'm a big supporter of yours, Sam. Hopefully <laughs> soon we'll see you in this race as well because I believe we need your type of leadership. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Again, another session. You've been viewing another session of the Open Mic Show, trying to keep you informed, giving you an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with those vying for office. It's important that you are able to connect with the people who have a plan. They say they have a plan. And this is the only opportunity um, right now that they have to really unveil their plan and their vision for the territory. Now you can go ahead and say, at least you, were, you, you have been told. So uh, again, we're open to anyone from any of the political parties. They can contact me anytime. If you know of someone that you would love to see on this show, they have a few days left. You give them a call and tell them you need to hear their plan. You need to see and understand their vision. So again, we're open to all the parties, VIP, NDP, PEP, PPA, whoever's running. We are <laughs> open. I am open. I am here. Just have them give me a call, and we can work out the details. So again, good night, and thank you for watching.